Now, earlier this week, it looked like the end of the lockdown could be in sight, with whisperings of restrictions starting to be relaxed as early as Monday. However, hopes were dashed yesterday as Boris Johnson told his cabinet he intends to proceed with maximum caution with only modest changes to rules before the end of this month. It means we could be in lockdown until June. The only certain immediate easing is that people can take unlimited outdoor exercise from Monday. Churches, mosques and other places of worship will also likely to be open, but only for private prayer. The Prime Minister, of course, addressing the nation on Sunday to outline the plans. James Dellingpole is a writer and Breitbart columnist. Um, I can almost hear you discombobulating at me <laughs> reading those paragraphs, James. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Ian. Yeah, I'm... I th isn't this the, the it's either the third or, or the fourth um, end of lockdown that's been hinted at and then and then snatched away from us just when we were looking forward to our to our freedom from what is it now uh, six seven eight weeks yeah, how's yeah. the rest? It's yeah, it is. We're into. I think we're into coming into week eight. I think. Oh my goodness! And isn't it isn't it kind of ironic that 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 we are celebrating VE Day? when when uh, our, our grandparents or great grandparents liberated liberated britain from the from the totalitarian tyranny of 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 hitler and and mussolini and here we are effectively having the kind of tyranny imposed on us in the name of 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 public health and safety and it's it's all for our own good i mean i'm 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 sure that a lot of a lot of the world's worst um, political agendas were imposed on people for their own good. <laughs> that isn't the problem? See, I want, I desperately want to agree with you. I desperately want to get you absolutely. Spoke to James Dellingpole today. Dellingpole was spot on. And then I speak oh, to a Ian, nurse. You're not, you're not a, a COVID bedwetter, are you? You're well, yeah. like, I, I, I'm getting hints of COVID bedwetter from but you. You see, there, there is maybe a scintilla of bedwetting going on here. And the reason oh, no. being, James, is because I then... I, <laughs> I then speak to a nurse or a doctor and they say, no, you can't go out because folk are getting infected. And then they come to people like us and we could get infected and the whole thing starts again. So well, who do I believe? The brilliant James got, Dellingpole or the brilliant a, consultant? When you've got a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, doesn't it? So clearly, if you're in a particular area of the NHS and you're dealing with, with um, extreme COVID COVID-19 cases, then you are going to think that this is just the greatest crisis that the nation has ever faced, and, and no effort is too great to defeat this, this monstrous thing. But we are currently in the middle of a global experiment. I mean, it's not, you know, we, we, we tend to forget in this country that it's not just us being locked down. It's, it's, it's people in America, people in Australia, people in South Africa. Uh, there are some countries which are, have got much more liberal regimes than we've got. For example, Sweden is the obvious one in, 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 in Europe. Um, and we've got countries like South Korea, Singapore. Um, and they seem to be doing better than we are, or at least that they are doing far, far less damage to their economies than we are. And this is my, this is my bigger worry, that people, people now on furlough they're enjoying this remarkable weather that, that we've been having. I mean, it's been unbelievable, hasn't it? It's sort of like, like I, I can't remember when April was that good, and now we're yeah, in May, and it's looking just as lovely. People are being seduced into imagining, well, I'm seeing more of my kids, and I'm getting, you know, maybe getting to shag the wife more, and, or, or, or whatever. Um, and they are forgetting that looming on the, over the horizon is the biggest economic catastrophe any of us uh, uh, will ever face. It's just enormous. It's, the, w w this is the worst economic crash since seventy, since the Seven Years' War, I think, in the early 1700s. Sure. That is quite yeah. serious. So for you, it was never... I mean, did, did you, from the very beginning, did you initially, James, think, OK, this is a, a killer virus, let's all yeah, yeah. batten I down did. the hatches, uh, yeah. and then gradually you've kind of turned a corner. You've yeah. seen a light that few have seen. It's a very fast-moving story. I, I, I think we can all be forgiven for, for, for what we thought maybe two or three months ago. I mean, I was, I was quite early on to the story because I was following the, the tweets coming out of, of China. And I had friends behind the, behind the bamboo curtain who were giving me updates daily on the horrors 
that were going on, or the alleged horrors anyway. Um, you know, mysterious things like like um, high concentrations of sulfur dioxide being observed by satellite over Wuhan, suggestive that bodies were being being piled on these huge piles and disposed in secret. It seemed at the time like the like the the, the mortality rate of this infection was much worse. It seemed like it was sort of 2.53. Actually, it's probably closer to 0.2 per, per person who gets infected. That's We've got 30,000 people dead, James. I mean, 30,000, yeah, sure. nearly 31,000. We've, we've been here before, haven't we? We've been here before in... 1968 was it the the Hong Kong flu? We've had this is this is not significantly uh, more deadly than epidemics we've had before. It's certainly not in the league of the Spanish flu of 1918. And yet we are doing enormous economic damage. We are condemning to death people who would have been treated in hospitals but are frightened to go with their cancers and so on. You know this is a, this is a big worry, which is I think going to uh, come back to bite us later. So I think there are all sorts of unintended consequences to this noble intention of protecting people from the coronavirus, which increasingly is looking like something which is not as bad as we thought it was going to be. I mean, obviously, I feel great sympathy for all those who've lost relatives um, as a result of it. But, you know, this is what happens during uh, uh, health crises you know, during pandemics. We've been here before, but we've never reacted in this way before. Would you lift the whole thing now? Everything back to yeah, normal? Totally, totally. I think. Look, the, the the thing is, we we are. Where do I where do I start? Um, uh, we were originally told that this was being done in order to enable the NHS to cope with the with the massive surge in, in uh, you know, need for ICU beds that would, that, would, that would emerge as a result of the crisis. This never happened. And that's, that's a good thing. You know, the, 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 the fact that we didn't use the Nightingale hospitals that we've, we've spent lots of our tax money on, well, it, it, it's good. It's having those empty is better than having them full of, of, of dying patients. So that's good. But the rationale for, for the lockdown seems to keep shifting. The government is being very secretive about its, its reasoning behind, behind the, the continuing lockdown. Originally, it was to, this is typical Boris Johnson, you know, it was to squash the sombrero. He couldn't say flatten the curve because that wasn't wacky enough. So he had to say squash the sombrero. <laughs> OK, nice one, Boris. So you squash the sombrero and yet you're continuing with the lockdown. Why? Well, now apparently they've come up with a new excuse. It's about apparently there's going to be a deadly second wave. Well, this is a theory. This is not this this is not um proven obviously because uh well you can't prove it until it happens but um we are being told that we've got to remain under house arrest because reasons which, which we haven't really been shown the evidence for on that point james we are going to speak again on this i know it'll be interesting to come back in a couple of weeks and just see where we're at on this meantime james delimpole writer and journalist thank you uh, with a very different view uh, from government convention on what is happening at the moment